Hello and welcome back to Three Questions, the show where I ask someone I admire three questions about their career. My name is Jake Strong and I want to waste no time getting into this episode. Today we have magician and actor Michael Carbonaro. You may have seen Michael on his hit TV show from True TV called The Carbonaro Effect, where he does magic for people unknowingly in a variety of situations. His latest live show, Carbonaro Live from Space, is a ton of fun and takes a look into a science fiction world of time portals and miniature bands. I'm going to be honest, I asked much more than three questions in this interview, but I thought nobody would be that hurt because it's not every day you get to talk to Michael Carbonaro. Michael's answers give us a background look into the Carbonaro effect and Michael's depiction of a perfect horror film. Let's get right into it. All right, so we are recording. And first and foremost, Michael, I just want to say thank you so very much for doing this. This is a huge pleasure of mine to have you on here. Yeah, you're the coolest. Thanks. I'm happy to be here. So um, The Carbonaro Effect is one of my favorite shows because I love to watch it because of how creative each piece is and how they fit into the setting that they're presented in so perfectly. That is by far what I love whenever watching The Carbonaro Effect. So what is the process of first choosing the shooting locations and then creating the pieces that you see in the show? Whoa, I'm taking a sip of coffee. This is so de detailed and complicated. Uh, hold on. <laughs> mm. Yeah, you know, um, some a lot of it is really fluid, both in creating the ideas and also the location. Sometimes we'll pick some locations that we can we think might be fun to, to come up with good ideas in. And other times we have a trick where we're like, OK, where would that fit? And we find the location for it. But most of the time for the like very candid camera -y stuff, like in the public locations, we think of locations first, you know, like anywhere from like a candy shop, an ice cream shop or a stationery store or cheese shop and be like, what could be fun in those places? And then we can start to jam. Other times we'd be like, oh, we're going to, you know, try and do a trick where I vanish in a porta potty. Should we be on a construction site? Uh, should we be, you know, at a fairground? And we'll go backwards that way. Wait, wasn't that a two part question? It was. Like yeah. And then creating the actual pieces once you pick where well, you're going to be. Yeah. He, you know, I'll tell you, th this is the thing. When, you know, I was doing hidden camera magic on The Tonight Show, and I'm certainly not the first magician to do magic with hidden cameras. I mean, Alan Funt from Candid Camera is the first hidden camera magician, first hidden camera innovator of all, actually. Yeah. But like even hidden camera magician, you know, some of the stuff that they got into later in Candid Camera, and there was like a billion episodes of those were very magical. They would put people in bizarre scenarios where something weird would happen, like a woman would drive into a gas station with a car without a motor, and we would be watching the reactions of real mechanics like completely dumbfounded how this woman and they would show you the secret. They'd show you them taking a car that had no motor and pushing the pushing the, the the lady down the hill so that she could roll right into the gas station and make it and all the guys would see her pull in so it looked like a legit car driving in so but it was putting people in those bizarre scenarios and seeing how they react um that made it made it so special and i loved that as a kid and i love special effects and all that so i always wanted to do some kind of show like that so there's been some other magicians who had done magic with hidden cameras before um but what 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 made this um oh my god jake i lost my train of thought again are you editing this don't leave it let let people know how much i wander i i, <laughs> I was going somewhere i was going somewhere with that because it was important to to um but, oh, coming up with the ideas. I mean, yes. we, I, when 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 it, I was doing magic on the on the Tonight Show, hidden camera yeah. magic segments, and it was like, OK, then then the notion was, how cool would it be to do like a TV show of, of this stuff? And mm -hmm. I literally thought to myself, OK, if I really put my mind to it, I bet I could make eight really good episodes of hidden camera magic. And that would be really hard. I mean, every Magic Clerk segment that I did, I did eight of them, and they were like four and a half minutes long, were so hard to, to come up with. It was really hard. It took the work of like Derek Delgadio and um, Handsome Jack and Derek Hughes. And uh, we, we were like rattling our brains trying to come up with stuff that would be cool. I mean, we were just in one location, so whatever. So I never thought for uh, in a million years, we'd have more than 100 episodes. So even now looking back at a question like, how do you come up with the ideas? It still seems like a mystery to me. I mean, we would 
it's incredible how much we were able to generate, you know, and I've, I had guys in the room from, you know, early on, it was Derek Delgadio again, and uh, David Regal got on right, right away. And Michael Weber and Matt Schick and Chad Sanborn and Darren Berger. Darren Berger was in the, was Darren in the pilot? No, Darren wasn't in the pilot. Chad was in the pilot. Um, and we just sat in a room and just started coming, coming up with as much stuff as we possibly could. And, I sit back in awe looking at how much we were able to take ordinary magic effects and put, you know, give them a new packaging and make them look like something neat out in the real world that people actually believed in. And also just come up with some really innovative new magic that that worked. I mean, every day we'd step in to do it, we would be like, you know, you would think after like four seasons, you'd be like, oh, we can make people believe in anything. But like even at any any day we were stepping into doing anything, we were like, oh, my God, there's no way this woman is going to believe that, you know, the, Chad turned to stone in a church like it's just too unbelievable. And then we'd pull it off and it would I would always sit back in awe like, wow. Yeah, there's an answer for you. <laughs> and it's so cool to me to watch the show and then to see methods that I recognize in totally new repackaged scenarios. I think it's so cool to, to see how you guys utilize all these different parts of magic in places that you don't normally see them. Yeah, me too. I mean, wow. Some of them that really stand out, like one, yeah. of, the, one of the ones to me that I'm just so excited we got to play with. Um, for example, it's like a really, it's a carny trick or like, you know, an old freak show trick, like the headless table illusion that we ended up using in the, uh, the, the episode where the head bloomed from that pod and it was a living head inside the pod. I mean, wow, we really like created a modern day wonder of what some people used to maybe go to Coney Island and be like, there's a living head on a table and like, maybe believe it. Like here, yeah. here we are now in like 2020 or whenever that episode aired and, and someone's going, Oh my God, there's a living head on a table. Like we like repackaged that whole device, that whole concept of making someone believe in that and, and made it work using the same method, but just in a gardening center and like that. I mean, that just charms my heart. I mean, how crazy is that? Of course, yeah. Yeah, and, and it was so cool seeing uh, your new show that you're doing now, Magic for Space, Magic Live from Space, because uh, it, it's one of my favorite things, because it's a great- no, Stan, a Stan Allen is doing Magic Live from Space. Magic Live? You're Stan Allen's doing Magic Live from Space. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm doing, no, Stan is Magic Live. Live from Space. It was right? a joke. Yeah, Live from Space, Carbonaro right. Live from Space. We did six of them. Uh -huh. I'm going to maybe do an encore of a few more. We're sort of talking about it right now. I have all the stuff. It's all set up. I had some other things I was doing, but it was fun. And there's a couple of other things I wanted to like clean up and give, give a try at. And some people who were like, Hey, I wanted to see it. So I'm like, you know, I can maybe do a couple more. So I might do a few more of those. That, that, that sounds wonderful because it was so much fun to watch this kind of marriage of science fiction. And then you were also kind of doing a show and tell with everything around your room and, right. and it all came together, which was awesome. So um, my question to you is what sparks your fascination with those little quirky objects that live in both Carbonaro Live from Space and the Carbonaro mm. Effect? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. What a good question. And it it, it goes right to the heart of like, two of my favorite things, one from the Carbonara effect and one that was in live from space, both inspired by each other. My favorite illusion from the Carbonara effect of all time is the builder beetles prank, which was at a hardware store where I had living beetles inside of a jar, just like you would see almost like Mexican jumping beans or something like at, at I used to see them as a kid, like little jumping beans at, at the grocery store. They'd be like on the shelf and there were these little things moving. I still have no idea. Is it half a worm? Like what makes those work? I don't know. Anyway, but so um, <laughs> the idea came out to be like, what if there were these beetles that could like, we ended up doing spirit nut, you know, like taking the nut off of the bolt and also having these little beetles living real beetles in a hardware store underneath a coffee can assemble toothpicks into these structures. And I had like real dudes believing in this, believing that like, you know, like taking the concept of like, well, a spider weaves a web into these intricate patterns. These beetles can kind of construct you know, pieces of twigs. And like all of a sudden these beetles are making an Eiffel Tower and they're like, what? Like, not an exact Eiffel Tower, but pretty too close to like, just on the edge of like wondering, is this really happening? Yeah. And that was my favorite prank of all time because I thought it had that charming essence, like you said, of of like just little weird magical things. Like that, that was a modern day flea circus. 
And so in Live from Space, I had the, you know, the gag called the Fiddle Faddle Band, which is literally the same thing. It's just a bunch of junk from a drawer, paper clips, buttons, pins, and I piled them up. And then I covered it with a coffee can, put a microphone near it, and you could hear them all moving around. And when I lifted it up, they had assembled themselves into this little junk drawer band. You know, you saw like a drum set with like, you know, quarters and and a, a penny balancing on the tops of uh, paper clips and it looked like a little band and they played well they you know the illusion was that they played the music for the rest of the show so i don't know what what that that just makes my heart glow when i oh my god maybe it's about et maybe it all came from et in the movie time bandits when i was a kid when i say heart glow i don't know those little like magical things in the universe that could possibly be real i i don't know how to answer the question other than to say i think you just nailed it i'm so fascinated by the idea of this like microcosmic patterns of reality that really are like little invisible threads and little bits of fairy dust in the universe that are kind of connected in some weird way and are opening portals and doorways that we don't know i mean that's sort of like what magic just sort of evokes anytime you see a sponge ball vanish you're like did that just slip into a, a hole in the universe that i didn't know about like that that just encapsulates all of magic yeah yeah, and the, the fiddle faddle band was so cool to me because it was the probably the last thing that I expected when I put when you put all those little things yeah. um, under the can and how you called back to it almost like it was a, having a live band at, at the tape yeah. of, the, of the show. It was it was awesome. That that was one of my favorite parts. I, I talked to my aunt and uncle about that. Yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. I'm glad you like that. Yeah, I had no idea. They, they, there were a few experiments with it. I mean, even only doing six of those shows so far, like it was still very experimental by the sixth show. It was like trying some things, seeing what would work. You know, there's a lot I would change, throwing things in, taking it out. You know, you don't get, you know, here I was just touring on the road for like four years with like material that I'd been honing since I was 13, you know, like, of course, a lot of new stuff in the show too, but I had staples in my stage show that I've been through every outcome most definitely possible. And I know which way to make it funny and which way to go. And all the lines are like bulletproof. And, and then all of a sudden to do something, you know, live from space was all brand new material, except for the tattoo trick. I did the tattoo trick in an early tour, but anyhow, um, it was uh, that was a real challenge on my end to like be like, God, you know, like it's it, it takes time. It takes flight time to make anything great. And like yeah. our world moves so quickly now that everything's like make the candy bar appear and then put it on your Instagram. You're like it's, it's like very quick instead of like, you know, sitting in a parlor for months and going, I think I've got this illusion down pat. I might invite Cindy and Jonathan over for an evening of tea and I'll show them my illusion I've been working on for months. Like it just, it's different. The world's so fast. So it's nice to be able to just, it's it, sometimes it's hard to just even be brave enough. For me, it was to just be brave enough to be like, I'm just going to try a show of all new stuff that doesn't like rely on the Carbonaro effect as its backbone. Yeah. and see what happens i mean it was a terrifying ride it was like a lot of highs and lows making live from space that's for sure and do you see you bringing anything from live to space to your actual uh show in person when it starts to open up like that or do you see this as kind of a venture that that, that is just in and of itself you know um that's interesting you asked that i i was like yesterday just kind of putting my my index cards back down on the table being like, where is all this leading to? And like, what am I doing? Be <laughs> in, 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 there's so much about live from space that was pieces of a big, huge, like Vegas Siegfried and Roy extravaganza show I wanted to make, or like a, a live one man kind of off Broadway, Broadway, Mr. Rogers meets Michael Carbonaro, kind of a magic you're in my apartment show. So I've been thinking about these concepts for a while. So it all kind of everything I'm doing, I think, is always on one. I don't know if it's it's I have a hard time separating what's what. I don't know what each project is always. It's like I'm always coming from the same source. I'm like, I don't know. I, I, yes. The answer is yes. Like, I want to see that space box moving on stage now. And I want to, yeah, you know, yeah. open a portal in time and drop, you know, a spectator's object through it and have it appear on the other side of the room in a live stage show. That is very much like, oh, the whole thing with the television in live from space with the looking in itself and itself and itself and itself, itself, that long tunnel. 
was something that I, I it was a, an image. And if you didn't see the show, like there's one part of the show where I aim the cam the camera that we're watching the show from at a television that is also watching the show. So it's like it's that if you ever hold a cam, if you ever plug your video camera, <laughs> people don't have video cameras covered now. If you ever <laughs> plug your camera like into a screen and then aim that camera at the screen, it creates an infinity infinity tunnel. So, and I, I used to do this with my VHS cam camcorder when I was a kid, that's all I wanted. You know, two things I wanted as a kid, one was a microphone and the other one was a camcorder. Like those were like, I want those things. I don't know why I just want to make and talk into a microphone and play with a camera. So one thing I discovered early on was that if you aim a camera at a TV, it like makes this really weird infinity tunnel where you see it the image of itself reflected on itself, on itself, on itself, on itself. So I'd been thinking about that as a stage piece where we open that tunnel of time. And I will do this. I will bring this into a stage show. And it was going to be something where maybe a spectator's ring disappears and goes through the screen into that tunnel of time and then appears in the camera. I never quite solved exactly what was going to happen with that plot, but that infinity tunnel I've been obsessed with since I was, 12 years old and had my first video camera. So I put it into this show and I thought, you know, working that with the Buddha papers was just perfect for like a virtual world. And we're all starting to like, we're all starting to see things differently, like flies, we're, you know, like we're, we're learning how to look at four images, four different people reacting on a screen at the same time. It's very different than before the pandemic, even Carbonaro effect wouldn't, you know, we, we argued over split screen, like split screen wasn't really a thing that was in the lang, you know, the optical language of viewership that people really kind of everyone, everyone could get on board with. But nowadays, yeah. like you could make a show that has four panels the whole time. And like our eyes are changing into giant fly eyes. We can watch things differently. So anyhow, I'm on another tangent again, but um, that infinity tunnel came and I would love to bring that back on stage too. So all of those elements are going to lead in. And I think I do want to have those dreams. I want to have like a, I don't know if it's in Vegas. I don't know if Vegas is really the place like it was when Siegfried and Roy had their big show extravaganza, but I'd love to have a big show extravaganza like Siegfried and Roy show, Roy's show. I don't know if it would be in Las Vegas, but somewhere it'd have to be a permanent place. Cause you're not traveling around with a show like that. And I do want to do an off-Broadway show. So yeah, it all ties together. You are going to have so much fun trying to edit this whole thing because I won't stop talking because I won't stop talking. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I really, really enjoy it. I'll just I'll just cut it up and mix it all together. So to or play it live. I don't care. Do whatever you want. Yeah. <laughs> um, and one of my favorite pieces from your live show, or should I say my actual favorite is shaving dream when you cover yourself in shaving cream and then you kind of mold yourself into monsters. And that was kind of my first introduction where I saw that you are really a huge fan of horror and horror makeup. Yeah. All that stuff. So my question to you is, of course, uh, in horror films are kind of the, the most prominent example. So according to Michael Carbonaro, what are the elements that go into a perfect horror film? If you could take Ooh. take from either a ton of movies, tropes, anything like that, what are the elements that go into a perfect horror film? That's a great question. Some elements that go into a great horror film. Um, you know, there's films that scare me, but I don't know if they make them the, I don't know if they make them my favorite kind of horror films It's not a lot of stuff scares me. Um, creep show two, there was this goo on the water in the lake that like was touching people and burning their skin and sucking them into the lake that scared the hell out of me. Was that a, gr was that my favorite kind of horror movie? Is that, does that count as an element of fear? Maybe, but I think. When I think of like my favorite, one of my favorite horror movies of all time is Return of the Living Dead. And it was um, this, it was not a sequel, but there was Night of the Living Dead that was out. The Return of the Living Dead was in the 80s, but it was the first film, first of all, the first film that used, uh, th that came up with the concept that zombies eat brains, which has kind of become a thing that we all kind of, no, <laughs> you know, like zombies eat brains, brains, brains. But th that was the first film where zombies were eating brains, like even Night of the Living Dead, the original George Romero film. Zombies weren't eating brains. They were just eating people. But anyway, um, but the film was met very, really meta theatrical because it starts 
there's these two guys and it's so carbonaro effect oh my god there's these two guys in a warehouse and they sell like science equipment like you know half taxidermy dogs in our uh, acrylic and dried butterflies like in like one of those things you'd see in a curiosity cabinet and bodies that they that they bring over to you know uh you know hospitals for medical students it was this kind of like yeah science I, I don't think there's really a place like that exactly like that but I believed it when I saw it anyhow they had all this kind of stuff there and um the newbie is there to work holy shit it's literally a carbon iron effect episode the newbie's there to work and the guy's telling him about what they store in this facility and he's like he says and here's where it gets meta theatrical he's like he says to the guy have you ever seen night of the living dead I know here's a now this movie is Return of the Living Dead, but he's like the kids like yeah he's like remember how those people were coming back to life he goes you know that was based on a real story and he's like get out of here he's like we have in the basement one of the pods that the government had been working on to try and bring their soldiers back to life or whatever the, I'm paraphrasing what the story was or something so any anyway they end up going into the basement and looking at this old army pod and accidentally cracking it and the gas leaks out and gets in their eyes and and they start dying and turning into zombies themselves and the gas being leaked into the facility starts bringing the taxidermies to life and then they try to burn a body and then it, it rains and it rains near a uh, a graveyard that's right around the corner so now that whatever army chemical is getting into the graves and the bodies come back so that's how that happened but it was like what what makes this a, a perfect horror movie to me, like what goes into the elements of it is a the, the story is so fascinating and it was really well directed. The sequences where you're like seeing the practical effects where you're seeing the rain fall and then you get this shot where the camera pans down under the earth and you watch the what this is the 80s. You're watching the water like leak into bodies in the graveyard you, you the whole story is being told so well and the concept is almost believable in a freakish way and it's it's reflective on itself because it's making fun of the very movie that it's making and it's funny like there's parts of it where you're laughing but then it's also really scary and so i love a little mix of of comedy a little self-reflection and a little bit of like really genius fun new concepts it was the first time in a movie where uh, zombies sp spoke because they they captured half of a zombie and like strapped her to a table and had a conversation with her and she's literally just like a flapping spine and a rotted upper torso and a skeleton puppet I mean it wasn't like a human at all and they're like why are you guys eating people you know and and she's like the and she explains to them that eating brains that it hurts to die that you can feel yourself rot and it hurts and eating human brains makes the pain of dying go away. <laughs> that was so freaking trippy and terrifying. Yeah. So it's like funny and wild. And I love the special effects and the puppetry and all that. So the elements of a good horror movie, I would say I like a little meta theatrics. I like a little bit of a laugh. You have to have that hot and cold shower, like back to the Grand Guignol, you know, like the Grand Guignol, the original horror theater back in Paris, it would be, they would do something to make you laugh. And then they would gouge somebody's eye out and you'd be like, ah, so it was like funny and then horrible and funny and horrible. And they'd splash you and splash you at these different temperatures. And I think that that's my, that would make the ultimate horror movie. Yeah. <laughs> and like you said, it is eerily similar to the Carbonaro effect, that entire scene that you pictured. I could picture that at the as like one of like the, the big pieces at the end of an episode. Totally true. Like they did this one gag in there where you know how they they take butterflies and pierce them with like a needle and put them into a frame. And it was like yeah. a frame, you know, it's like taxidermy butterflies. And uh -huh. there's one one part where they're talking. And just in the background, all of a sudden you start to see the butterfly's wings starting to flap in the picture. Like they don't see it, but you see it, the viewer. Uh -huh. And then I learned later that it was this amazing gag that they just like blew air onto them with no glass in the frame and it made their wings like flutter a little. And I had just, I just learned that I think in the last five years and I've seen that movie way back in the eighties. So I was like, that's how they did that. Like here I am picturing these like little mechanical butterflies or strings or whatever but no they just blew air on it and i'm like there you go like that's a magician's work and that's what i think ties i have a real like real uh, my threshold for cgi is really like i have a bittersweet 
you know, hatred, love of CGI because it's good. It's great. It works and there's places to use it. But boy, oh boy, it, it really can ruin something very quickly. There's, there's just something about seeing. Even if you know a puppet is fake, it's still more real than knowing a CGI is fake. So like CGI gets really weird in movies. Um, so I love seeing all that practical stuff. And what the Carbonaro effect was, was pulling practical effects off on real people in real time out in in public, you know, and or private, wherever we were shooting that thing. But, yeah. you know, and we had to edit. Yes, there were times where we would be using distractions and misdirection. And then we were like cutting away for the home viewer watching the Carbonaro effect. So they don't see what that person didn't see. So there's a lot of like you could like get into ethical like, is that a camera trick? It was like it's never a camera. It was never a fake person not really reacting to what they actually saw. So like that yeah. was the that was our rules. And it was everything else is fair game, you know, pre show, whatever the hell you want to do, distractions, whatever, to get them to really ride that thing in their mind and believe that that moment is happening and hopefully get enough moments of real one shot magic in there that keeps it all onerous and beautiful and i'm really proud of the balance we were able to pull off on a like cable network with not a billion dollars by the way like so like you know like we did some things where like sometimes we just have to like you know be really you know use stagecraft and just be super bold and sneaky but those are the ones that really work as long as the person believes it in the end and it's cool enough so um, but they were practical effects, just like old school special effects, literally old horror movies would use the same device where you you start to see the thing morph and then you cut to the reaction of the person screaming and then you cut back and now it's a little bit different. You know, like we would do things like that all the time. We distract the person and switch one prop out for another prop and that would do something more and that, but it still looked like the same one. So there might be like one trick that you, you know, even might, might well, I don't want to say this one, but like, you know, something that you see in the show where it's, let's say a soda can, you see one soda can, but in order to create what actually happens over the six minutes, there's four different soda cans. That that I'm switching not only from the viewer at home watching, but I'm actually switching out in real time in front of that real person. And he doesn't know that there's that many soda cans. So like it, it's all valid and real, but it's practical effects. None of it's like, oh, we'll just paint that in later or we'll just, you know, you know, put a digital soda can floating in the room like none of that ever happened. So that's yeah. what was exciting about getting into a real I get I felt like I get to retain being an 80s kid by um getting to do a tv show where we we relied on having to do like actual 80s special effects prop special effects sequences yeah and for for the methods uh on the carbonara effect do you find yourself being able to go a little bit more bold sometimes because maybe the person isn't necessarily expecting something worse to happen i mean that's like a the golden ticket like the willy wonka golden the person doesn't know something's going to happen which means until their ears perk up you know, like, you know, how, like David Regal has this awesome theory and it's and it's for magic when you're performing for spectators. And it's especially true for our show, maybe even more steps. But the, the theory, he says, the first one is free. <clears throat> Do you know that? Yes. Like if yes. you're doing a co yeah, coin sequence, whatever, like the first one disappears and they go, wait a minute. Did I just see that disappear? You could be a lot more bold on that first one. But now they're going to burn and watch that second one. So the second one's got to be really elusive. So with the Carbonaro effect. They're there to work at a, you know, an engineering lab that's trying out a cryogenic machine for the first time. You have so much time before they ever start to like before they even step foot into the zone of maybe I'm being pranked. Once they're in maybe I'm being pranked, you're not going to get away with like running behind a wall or like yeah. walking them into the next room or saying, hey, look over here for a second because now they're watching. But like, sure, like we would take advantage of whatever Mr. It's it's like the balls over the head, the cotton balls over the head, or I use cotton balls in my show, but the paper balls over the head trick. You know what I mean? It's that it, showing how we did a lot of the sequences in a lot of ways would be maybe more entertaining, certainly not less entered. Well, it'd be different. But for magicians, gosh, so many times I would love to just show magicians the amount of paper balls over the head you know, show them the wide shot where we did something so bold that you're like, oh, my God, like, did you just like switch a car with the balls over the head method? You know what I mean? Like, 
yes, we did. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> wild. So like, I don't think that would actually take away from the engineering of it or the ingenuity of the, there's something really sexy about how bold that was. Yeah, yeah. And and even for the paper balls over the head, the audience uh, not only thinks it's funny, but they also appreciate that you're doing it without the person there noticing. Yeah, and I think there is that. I have a thing about that now too, with like, I mean, exposure is it's an interesting it's been it's been part of the excitement of of special effects for my myself i mean they sometimes they say like some people love to learn how magic works they love puzzles and they love solving puzzles and other people don't want to know like i hear that a lot but the other part is like you know i remember as a kid when i would watch these movies and then get fangoria magazine and look and see how the effects were done and then they would very seldom like it's all over the place now but like man when you got to see a behind the scenes featurette of them making a movie it was a, it was a mind bender it was like what like i still didn't even understand where all those boards bouncing light was and why was there only half a wall i'm like wait a minute well i don't understand how this is being made you know we have a different sensibility of knowing that stuff now as a society because we do it a lot of us are doing it a lot of us are going into work each day with a mess on one side of the room and a clean room on the other they we kind of understand making a set but like um uh, but but learning the secrets and how the strings move the puppets and how they would fill, you know, they how they covered Michael Jackson's face with that alginate and made the mold for Thriller for him to turn into the werewolf. Like, oh, I loved learning the methodology of those secrets. And I think, you know, this was my first magic book, I say, is Tom Savini, who's a makeup artist. Uh, he did Friday the 13th and Dawn of the Dead and Creepshow and with all practical techniques and he's got a forward in his book by Stephen King and one of the things that he says you know Stephen in the book is like you know okay Stephen King like talks about this scene in in creep show where they have to have like thousands of cockroaches all over this motel room a hotel room and you know nowadays of course you'd be like well CGI I'm but back then it was like what and and Stephen King was going to put this movie out and Tom Savini was going to do the effects and Stephen King's wife was like how on earth do you expect this man to create this illusion? And they ended up doing this incredible thing where they took um, pistachio shells and painted them black and shiny and covered the floor with pistachio shells and then got a bug guy to put like, you know, a few hundred cockroaches on top of those shells. So you, it looked like, what an illusion, right? Like yeah. it looked like thousands and thousands of bugs because you saw enough moving. The other ones were just shiny. So, and then he talks about literally in the forward of this book, he's like, you know, and this was a freaking miracle and it was amazing. And then he says, you know, so, hey, Tom, you know, this is Stephen King talking to Tom Savini. He's like, so just, but be careful. Like, don't give too much away because it's part of the magic of the movies is going and going, how the hell is that? Like, what? how is that happening? Is part of that magic. So there's always even just the debate in the, in the world of filmmaking about what you show and what you don't show, because it is fascinating to see and it's not. And I think there's a world, Penn and Teller ride that dance of like, we expose, but then they fool you with it. And you're like, are they exposing? Are they just being naughty? I don't know. Then there's dickheads online just revealing crap and showing stuff like just for just the sense of getting their video watched, which is not artful. And I don't know, like, but I get, I get that there's a, I, I was going to end my live from space show revealing how I did the final illusion of, of reversing gravity and being pulled to outer space. I thought I'd rather people at home go, Oh my God, that clever little dog. And how neat is that? Then think to themselves, oh, he pre-recorded some camera trick or something because I didn't. And I was like, then I ended up just leaving it and not not exposing it. But I'm still even in the idea of doing encore shows. I'm like, is there a world where I kind of show there's a really cool story of how I like pulled off this grand illusion in my tiny little office? Like, it's like pretty wild to think like in a pandemic, like here's what I utilized and here's how I made it work. And it's a neato perspective trick that like is kind of fascinating to see how it works so I really struggled with like how neat would it be over the credits to just watch the whole thing unfold and almost like when Penn and Teller are upside down on SNL 
you know, at the end of the segment yeah. and the camera turns and you're like, oh, I get it. Like it was almost <laughs> going to be one of those moments. But anyhow, so there you go. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and for everyone listening, what basically what happens at the end of uh, Live from Space, Michael just kind of floats away <laughs> at the end. Right. That's, that's, that's really the 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 best way to, to describe it. And uh, and it's just so perfect for the show. It makes so much sense. It, and it's so unexpected. And when, when I saw that happen, I was like, that's awesome. That is exactly. Yeah. Exactly what I and want. now you know you must have like just backtracked in your head and gone like it's got to be something like this like this like this mm -hmm. right like you you know what's up yeah you'd maybe you're like when did and how and where but like you know what's up right mm -hmm. yeah you know you know so so it's like yeah but like I almost want that's that's what I want I want everyone in America to kind of know that it's like it's Lionel Richie dancing on the ceiling it's like Nightmare on Elm Street when Tina gets you know, uh, like carried up the walls as she's being murdered in her nightmare. You know, like I want you to kind of know what's going on there. And that's why I did the thing with the finger in the beginning. I was trying to show you like, look, this is magic. It's all one shot, but I'm going to mess with your perspective. And that's the that's the rules. I'm just not going to screw with, you know, CGI. So there you go. I'm so happy to hear you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, that. <laughs> Hi. Well, Michael, I really, really Hi. appreciate it. And um, all I want to say <laughs> is um, thank you so very much for your time. Uh, seriously, this has oh, been welcome, a huge dude. pleasure of mine. Oh, dude, you're so cool. I love that you're doing this podcast. I've listened to a few of them. And your questions are so awesome. And I, I don't know who your following is, but hi to everybody out there. And I think you're really, you know, you're right on that zone of... Um, the people who want to know a little and also don't want to know a little. It's like we're like right on that tightrope. I, I love it. So congrats to you. And thank you so much for having me. My absolute pleasure. I hope to see you in person sometime. You got it, bud. Again, a huge thank you to Michael for taking the time to talk with me. He is a super sweet guy, and this conversation honestly meant the world to me. So Michael, if you're listening to this, and I know I overuse these words, thank you, thank you, thank you. If this is your first time tuning in, and I'll say it again, thank you. I have a lot of exciting upcoming episodes for this season, and I'm excited to share the rest with you. As usual, if you have any questions or want to make a donation to help the podcast, email jake at jakestrongmagic.com. Already hearing the gracious comments about this pod has meant the world to me, and I'm excited to make more. Thanks again, everyone. Stay safe, and I'll see you next week.